and then we'll go live on Facebook. Perfect. And it's going live now. Let me just double check that people can see us on Facebook. And I think they can. So let me just do that really quick on our social media platforms. Perfect, so we can take questions from Facebook now. And Okay, perfect. So we should be all ready to start. I know we have more people joining us, which is great. And then we have some people connecting on Facebook. For those of you that are on Facebook, this uh, webinar is presented in English. If you would like to um, hear this in Spanish, join us in the Zoom uh, link that you'll find on our website, or you can see the recording in Spanish um, in the next few days that we'll have it ready. And also um, feel free to ask any questions that you might have um, on, on, on the comments for Zoom and comments for the Facebook Live. Para los que nos están viendo en Facebook, esta grabación, este seminario en línea solamente se va a escuchar en inglés, pero si tiene, si quieren escucharlo en español, ah, pero no se escucha en Facebook. Ah, entonces, si pueden, eh, si quieren escucharlo en español, pueden meterse a nuestro website y ahí está el link para que nos acompañen en español. Perfect. So. We are, we should be ready to start. We have some people connected on Facebook and we have um, people joining here. Uh, sounds good, perfect. So again, my name is Carla Colin. I am the program and membership manager with the Latino Chamber. I wanna welcome everyone on Zoom, our panelists on Facebook. And now I also wanna welcome Norma. Norma is part of our board of directors, but she also does a tremendous job in regards of sustainability, and I couldn't have done this webinar without her. Uh, I am here just to support, but our main contact for sustainability in the chamber has been Norma for the past couple of years, and we've had um, done a great partnership. She has done a tremendous job supporting small businesses, and we are going to talk about um, Sustainability 360, what does that mean? How are we gonna approach the future with um, in a sustainable way specifically for small businesses? And what does that mean in, in regards of saving money, spending money and accessing to programs that are available, um, not only within Boulder County, but there are other programs that are available statewide. And our panelists are gonna talk a little bit more about that. But uh, before that, I'm going to let Norma introduce yourself, please. Absolutely. Thank you and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Carla said, uh, my name is Norma King. I'm part of the Board of Directors, but also work directly with sustainability uh, manners. Uh, being part of the PACE team, OSCAR, the Office of Sustainability, Climate Action, and uh, Resilience with Boulder County. So I'm a bilingual advisor for the small businesses. And my main interest is, of course, to bring all the benefits and opportunities to address climate change, which is a big issue right now in the whole planet. So as we know, climate change is a reality. It's here. It's not anymore something that is far away from us happening in other countries. We are now experience, uh, experiencing health and economic impacts caused by hotter summers, record-breaking wildfires, flash floods, for air quality and extreme drought in different zones. Even though we have in Colorado a more, more wet time this summer, that is, those extreme uh, temperatures are happening around the globe. So today we will talk about clean transportation alternatives, small businesses equity program, like the electric landscaping grant. We just launched that program a, a three, three months ago. Waste reduction and circular economy. So incentives, rebates, and special programs are available for you to reduce carbon emissions 
And that's why we have today, we have invited a great group of panelists, not only to raise awareness, but to present practical solutions, especially for small businesses. And their triple bottom line, which is the concept that has the three Ps, people, planet, and profit. So I have the pleasure and delighted to introduce you to our prominent panelists today. So please, panelists, uh, I will call your name, introduce yourself, your title, and what do you do in your organization? So I'm going to start with Gabriela Perkins, after Julia Davila, Randy Murman, uh, and Toby Russell. Please go ahead. Thanks, Norma. Thank you for having us here today. I'm excited to talk to you all about my work and what we do. I work for an organization called Drive Clean Colorado. I do EV charging infrastructure coaching. So if you're looking for charging stations, I am your coach for the Denver metro region. Um, our team is growing really quickly. So there's a lot of, uh, it's a busy time. So it's a great time for funding and incentives for EV charging. So if you're ready or thinking about making the switch, it's a great time. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you all today. We'll pass it to the next panelist. Thanks, Gabriella. I also work with Drive Clean Colorado. Um, I am a project manager for our Drive Electric Colorado initiative, which is an initiative that educates people about electric vehicles, charging incentives, e-bikes, all of that. So if you have any questions about anything EVs, um, driveelectricolorado.org is your resource for that. And yeah, happy to answer any questions on EVs on this webinar. If not, we also do offer free coaching for the future too. Randy. Well, yes, thank you to the chamber for having us for this very important conversation today. My name is Randy Mormon. I'm the Director of Policy and Community Campaigns at EcoCycle. And just a little bit of background about us. We are a 47 year old grassroots based organization based out of Boulder County. Uh, we are a social enterprise nonprofit uh, focusing on zero waste. We innovate, implement, and advocate for local and global zero waste solutions to foster a more regenerative, equitable, and climate resilient future. Um, many of you may know us in different aspects of our work. So, here in Boulder County, we run the Boulder County Recycling Center where all your single stream recycling goes to be processed and resold in the market. We also haul recycling and composting to our local businesses here in Boulder County. Some of you may be our clients. Uh, we run the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials or CHARM here in the city of Boulder. We are in all the schools in Boulder County teaching kids about environmental stewardship and zero waste. And we also provide outreach and education in the community and advocate for zero waste policies at the local and state level. So I'm excited to be here today and talk to you about what's happening in the zero waste realm of sustainability. And the last but not the least, Toby. You are mute, maybe? I am indeed. Thank you, Norma. Um, my name is Toby Russell. I work with um, Boulder County. Um, I'm with the Partners for a Clean Environment program. We are a program that is there to support businesses in becoming more sustainable by providing funding, expertise um, in, in all areas, whether it be energy, um, waste, or, or water conservation. We're kind of the one-stop shop for sustainability for small businesses in Boulder County, and I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Thank you so much. So let's start our panel right now, our conversation. So I think I'm going to um, start with driving clean Colorado, asking you or making this comment. Transportation is the second largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Colorado. So clean transportation will become crucial in the reduction of those emissions. So your organization delivers a variety of programs to support equitable clean transportation. So tell me a little bit or tell us what is Drive Clean Colorado? Great, yeah, that's a great question. So our nonprofit does a lot of work in helping to clean up the transportation. We know that that's a huge source of emissions um, specifically to disproportionately impacted communities. So our organization works really hard to help communities adopt cleaner forms of transportation through all 
all ways of transportation. So we focus a lot on community engagement, helping consumers get electric vehicles and helping coach like just the regular buyer on that process. But we also help fleets, small businesses, large businesses, everyone of all size um, who are working in our communities, help them get um, alternative transportation too. And we know electric is a great source for a lot of consumers and small vehicles, but we know it's not always the the best option for some heavy duty type of applications or fleets. Um, so we are fuel agnostic as, as an organization. Um, so we work with a portfolio of different fuel types to help organizations and entities find what works best for them. Um, anything to avoid diesel and gasoline. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what our organization does as a whole. We take a really equitable approach in all of the work that we do in our transportation um, coaching. Um, we focus a lot of our efforts on disproportionately impacted communities. There's several of those located in Colorado, and those are areas that are really heavily impacted by um, emissions from corridors, um, factories, all sorts of environmental um, factors that play at those communities specifically. And we know they're more negatively impacted than others when it comes to health, like asthma and things related to that. So um, our mission is to really help do our part to clean up the transportation space to make the air across Colorado more clean for everybody. We see the big brown cloud in Denver. So our, our goal is to try to help chip away at that through transportation. Which drives me to make a comment that it's a nonprofit organization. So your mission is definitely to support the people and provide valuable information that they can contact you in case they are considering to, to acquire electric vehicles or participate in other programs. That of course, we'll go in detail a little bit ahead, but that's super interesting. So I would like also just to mention a little bit that we will add some information about other programs like the electric bike program that is coming up soon. I know we have Leah Jensen here around that she's very enthusiastic about that. And we will provide information about that as well with our panelists. So I would like to now to go with um, Toby for the Oscar and Pace. So uh, in regards all these uh, redundant in, um, in the air quality conditions we are facing like a crisis in air quality, especially in the front range. So uh, Pace have, right now in place a program that is um, addressing uh, the air quality condition in the landscaping area. But I want to start, Toby, asking you why the equipment using used in land care is a source of routine concern among the city of Boulder and other Boulder County community members. Thank you, uh, Norma. I think um, we all, know about landscaping equipment we hear it a lot when we are we are in our homes and in our businesses outside and um, there's a few different concerns that that folks have with landscaping equipment and you pointed to probably one of the the biggest which is landscaping equipment has a huge amount of, of pollutants it is really really bad for air quality if you think about a leaf blower um, if you use a leaf blower for an hour, it's the equivalent amount of air pollution as driving a passenger car to um, California. It's a 14 hour drive in a passenger car for one hour off a leaf blower in terms of pollution. So that's one of the, the concerns is the concerns around air quality that you brought up at the beginning of this conversation. I think another concern that folks have with the gas powered traditional uh, landscaping equipment is that um, anything that is, is run on, on gas, on petrol, um, has uh, impacts on GHG, uh, greenhouse gases, on our environment and climate change. Um, so there's a real interest in moving towards electric powered equipment um, because it does not have that same impact on, on climate change. So um, that's, that's kind of two sides of the coin. And then the third side of uh, things that people think about with landscaping equipment and um, perhaps makes people even more frustrated is the, the noise. 
that happens from commercial landscaping equipment. You're in a meeting trying to listen to someone on a Zoom presentation um, and you hear the leaf blowers and the lawnmowers going. Um, so a lot of people have concerns around that. So there are many reasons why, why people are looking into what is the future of landscaping equipment. That's awesome. Uh, Carla, feel free also to um, to ask the questions as you see, or the audience is uh, typing their questions. Feel free to interrupt. So, Toby, um, I have here for years like some regulations and laws taking place in regards to land care equipment. Do you know what is the state? Uh, what in what stage we are? What is the status of these? Uh, laws and policies because um, it's very important for our small businesses right now that they are landscapers and how we can address that. Yeah, no, so uh, I think just to, to make sure at the beginning, we are we are a program of Boulder County and we are here to support small businesses in sustainability. So we are not directly involved in any of the regulations and the conversations around uh, regulations that are, are happening, but it is really important that we are aware of what is going on so that we can support um, the businesses that do landscaping and that will be impacted by any bans and regulations that take place. Um, so that I know a little bit, um, but I know that there are conversations happening, say, in the city of Boulder um, around potentially banning um, gas powered uh, landscaping equipment, they are not, they have not made any decisions on that yet. It probably would not be a complete ban because there's an understanding that there is a need for um, high, using equipment in the fall, but, but it's happening and it could be happening in the next few years. There's also conversations happening at the state level around the, the phasing out of gas powered landscaping equipment for both residential and commercial. Um, and, and that will look like potentially only being able to buy electric moving forwards. Um, but with all these things in place, right? Like th those may be happening, but we need to make sure that um, people are getting the experience with, with the, the, the electric equipment before bans take place, that the small businesses that are impacted by bans are supported um, before the bans happen and while the bans are happening so that they are not, not the ones that are being negatively impacted by governmental policy. Yeah, and, and that's very important. So we, we are presenting here the challenges, but also we, have, we will provide good news <laughs> what, what we are doing in the same time that this crisis is, is coming uh, with the air quality conditions. Also, there are some, some good news for the small businesses. And, and I will ask you, Toby, later about the program that um, PACE is, is piloting right now. So my uh, I'm going to, to uh, talk. Norma, to, sorry, yes? I, sorry to interrupt really quickly. Please. I just want to mention uh, to those business owners that are watching us through Facebook or that are joining us here, we are going to have um, solutions for, for all of you, and we are going to have uh, programs that are that are adequate for the local small businesses. We are always advocating for the needs of, of the small businesses, but also we want to hear from you. If you have questions, if after this webinar, you are like, I want to connect with Toby, I want to connect uh, with all, any other of uh, the panelists, please feel free to reach out. Norma is always open to go uh, visit businesses and offer them the programs that are available in the county. So, um, and I have a really quick question in the chat that says, do you have um, Spanish speaking representatives in each one of the organizations to support the communities that only speak Spanish? And, and that's a, good, a really good question that all of our panelists um, can, can answer. I will let our panelists to answer that. And then at the end, so we can address how about PACE um, specific situation, so go ahead. Toby, you wanted to, um, to start? 
Sure, I, I will absolutely start. So Partners for a Clean Environment has had, we do have Spanish speaking advisors, actually Norma, who's leading this call is, is, is on our team and is a rock star and able to uh, guide and support anyone that's interested in making their business more sustainable um, in getting there. Um, so we, we have we have multiple Spanish speaking advisors and we really are trying to redesign our programming to better support um, uh, Spanish speaking businesses because traditionally we have not done such a good job of that. So we're really trying to, to shift it to be more inclusive so that we are supporting those that have been underserved for the longest. And also from the standpoint of the uh, programming designing, uh, we have been um, with very better equitable practices, implementing those programs, uh, listening what the Latino community has to say. That's good for you to know that we are always open to, to hear your voice and uh, no create programs for the sake of what is coming from, from the government. It's more programs that are taking uh, account of your voice and what are the things you need. So that's what is super important, the equity component in this conversation. So anyone else of the other organizations have, are going towards or have some support of the Spanish speaking or other minority representations? I feel, I feel curious. Yeah, I can speak for Drive Clean Colorado. So we um, work really closely with the Colorado Energy Office on all of our community outreach. Um, they have a team of equity advisors that we work really closely with. So at every single one of our Drive Electric events, you'll see an equity advisor with us who's there on site to provide translation and things like that. Um, a lot of our, most of our Drive Electric materials that we take with us to events are translated, or we have a QR code that will take someone to a translated version of the, the document. Um, so we do try to be as equitable and inclusive as we can as well at our events to make sure that we're sharing this information with all of the, the great uh, different communities that are part of what we consider Colorado. And then we also um, provide equity-based coaching as well. So those advisors, if they want to reach out to us and have questions about how do I install an e uh, install an EV charging station, they can support that process as well um, so that we can do really one-on-one -on -one coaching and, and still provide that interpreter support. Gabriela, and I want to add something that makes me super excited and is that with you, in partnership with Drive Clean Colorado, we are going to host the very first uh, Ride and Drive, which is the electric vehicle, vehicle um, Ride and Drive event. So we are in the making, so we'll keep the community paused about it. It's uh, our first adventure where we are going to be very focused in the Spanish speaking resources and and for our uh, Latinos, we love cars. So <laughs> we just want to touch them and try them and, and break those myths that we have in mind that they are probably not good enough for my work and things like that. So uh, I love to have this partnership because you can address all that kind of questions and, and um, fears that we might have about something brand new like electric vehicles, electric bikes and other uh, kind of programs that you handle. So, Thanks, Norma. Yeah, we appreciate that. We we really think the best way to get people to switch to an electric vehicle is to get them to try one. So we're really excited to take on this opportunity with you as well. So thanks for including us. Randy, how about you in the multicultural, multicultural setting? Yes, thank you for the question. It's very important. So at EcoCycle, we have a long history of working in BIPOC communities, and we have um, had numerous organizers in those communities on different outreach campaigns around zero waste that are bilingual. Uh, most recently, we worked in the cities of Longmont, Lafayette, and Denver. And then just over this past year, we started a great partnership with CLARO, the Colorado Latino Leadership Advocacy Research Organization, and had a fellow work with us at the state level on state policy. And we hope to continue that partnership with them as well. And, and I myself am bilingual. Awesome. So now the next question will go to you, Randy. So funding in Boulder around 1966, EcoCycle is one of the nation's oldest and largest nonprofit recyclers. So we are having a global plastic crisis. 
um, the ever increasing production of disposal of plastic is fueling a global crisis affecting ever ecosystems and species on earth and the ecosystem, the ecosystem is affecting us, us is, is polluting our regular life. It's nothing that happens just in nature. So what is the Colorado Pollution Reduction Act and how plastic is so harmful for the human health? Thank you for that question. So uh, I'll start by saying, and to your point, the plastic pollution, um, that we are seeing on this on on planet Earth is is impacting us all, but it is disproportionately impacting BIPOC communities, um, and we look at that through the whole life cycle of plastic from its production, manufacturing, consumption, the extraction of the natural resources that needed to make plastic, and then also then finally the disposal of that, whether it's in a landfill or incineration. Um, all of that, all along, all along that life cycle of plastic impacts us in our health and our environment. And we see a lot of BIPOC communities that are on the front lines dealing with that pollution. And so it's it's really a, a crisis moment for us to address our plastic pollution. Um, at the state level, we have taken some pretty aggressive um, policies, and one in particular is the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act that you mentioned that was passed in, in 2021. And um, it its implementation began this past January with the single-use carryout bag fee, the 10 cents on paper and plastic bags in large retail stores. So I imagine most of you have, have seen that now since it began in January. And what we have done at EcoCycle to help local communities and businesses with the implementation of that is we have built a toolkit um, that I will put the link in the chat for you all. And, mm -hmm. and that includes some very valuable tools around the, the bag fee and the coming bag ban um, that can be helpful for businesses in particular. So here's the link for the business toolkit. And um, that includes resources like the list of exempted businesses, um, store posters, shelf talkers, checkout link signage, and training materials for employees. So hopefully that will be helpful specific to the bag fee. And then coming January 1 of 2024, we will have a plastic bag ban um, that will fall in line with, with that part of the law. The, uh, the one thing that I do want to focus on, it's going to be very new with the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act and will have an impact on restaurants, is the polystyrene ban that starts in um, also January 1 of 2024. And that commonly known as, as styrofoam, um, but polystyrene is, is the containers of food and beverage um, that will be banned at all retail food establishments. Um, the purpose behind the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act is really to reduce and mitigate plastic pollution like we've been talking about. Both plastic bags and polystyrene containers pollute our parks, waterways, and natural environments, and they endanger wildlife, and, and then they break down into microplastics that contaminate our water and soils and eventually get into our food. So according to the World Wildlife Fund, it is estimated that humans consume an average of a credit card's worth of plastic a week. Um, and, you know, it, it is having an impact, as I said, on our environment and our health. And then the last thing I'll say is about polystyrene in particular poses a serious health risk. Um, components of it are known carcinogens which are released into the air and water and communities near those facilities that produce polystyrene. And then consumers are at a higher risk of ingesting those carcinogens when polystyrene comes in contact with oily and hot foods. Um, so this act was really um, designed to go for the worst of the worst. So those plastic bags and the polystyrene um, and to, to ban those as, as the, the act will be doing and after um, January 1 of 2024. The last thing that I'll leave with you is another toolkit that we just released. And this was in a great partnership with PACE. Um, and this is our a guide to sustainable serviceware for restaurants. And this will be hopefully helpful to your restaurant businesses um, 
to look at what those alternatives are out there to polystyrene. And I'll be happy, um, I could go on and on, so I'm gonna stop there and make sure that's shared with you all. But um, as there are questions later, I'm happy to take them in regards to that guide that we just released and, and how that works. So thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Randy. So we coming back to the Drive Clean Colorado, um, and this is something that is very interesting, but I have to admit that it's sometimes confusing and is there are many state and federal grant programs that exist to increase alternative transportation adoption. So I really would like you to tell us uh, what are the different type of incentives and also probably to navigate us through and even um, mentioning probably telling Talking about all of them are going to stay forever in your head, but at least in, through the, your website, we can navigate and understand better what are the electric vehicles that credits and the federal and state of Colorado. Uh, and also with the e bikes So please, Julia and Gabriela, would you like to uh, share with us and with our audience this important information about all the opportunities for um, electric, electric vehicle purchase? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So for EVs, there are both state and federal tax incentives that you can get for the purchase of a new EV. And at the federal level, there's also incentives for used EVs. So starting with state tax credits, um, you can get up to $5,000 for the purchase or lease of an electric vehicle. And then this can be stacked with a federal EV tax credit, which is up to 7,500. There are some stipulations for this tax credit being broken up into two halves based on if the battery components were manufactured or assembled in North America, and if those minerals were processed um, in, the, in the US or a country that we have a free trade agreement with. So I know that's a little confusing. Um, however, we have all this information on the Drive Electric Colorado website on our EV incentives page. Um, some other things to note about getting the federal tax credit is that um, the it's only eligible for EVs under $80,000, and then there are some income caps. But the other good thing about the federal tax credit is that it also has incentives for used EVs. So if you're maybe looking into a used EV instead of a new purchase, um, it's a great option because there's a lot more used EVs on the market now. They're a lot more affordable, and a lot of them still have really great range and really great batteries. So it's not really as much as, um, something to worry about with batteries as it is about, you know, if it's fits your lifestyle better and is more in your price range, I think used EVs are a great option. So for that, you can get $4,000 for a pre-owned EV or up to 30% of, of the vehicle price. Um, it does need to be purchased from a certified dealer and under $25,000. Like I said, all these stipulations are going to be on the website. So for more of kind of like the fine print stuff, definitely check that out over there. And then don't forget about incentives from your utility as well. So Excel Energy also offers incentives both for EVs and for charging. So they do offer income qualified incentives for uh, purchasing an EV or um, a used EV. So they'll offer $3,000 for a used EV or $5,500 for a new EV. This is in the form of a rebate, so not a tax credit. And then for charging, they also have incentives for installing EV chargers at your home or putting that towards the purchase of a level two charger, as well as some incentives for charging off peak, which is usually overnight hours, which is going to save you money and is better for the environment. Um, so they have a, a nice variety of a lot of incentives for um, Excel Energy Electricity customers that you can take advantage of. And then lastly, for e-bikes. Um, there's going to be an e-bike, a statewide e-bike discount program starting um, in mid-August for income qualified um, residents in Colorado. So we're keeping an eye on for when this um, officially launches. But to qualify for this program, you have to buy the e-bike from a participating, participating bike retailer, and you can get up to $1,500 for an e-bike purchase um, for income qualified. And so I guess the range is from 900 to 1500 for that. Um, we also have this information on our website. And this is a great opportunity for 
if maybe you aren't quite ready for making the full jump to an EV, maybe an e-bike is a better fit for you. There's a lot of options out there in terms of cargo e-bikes that you can use to go to the grocery store um, or to run your errands that can fit a lot of things on the e-bike. And it's a lot less um, cost commitment to put towards purchasing a bike than an EV. So keep that in mind. Uh, we support all things electric, all things that are going to be, you know, helping improve our air quality. So whether that's even just walking, carpooling, taking public transport, e-bikes or, e or EVs, all of that is great. And um, yeah, make sure to check out our website for information on all these incentives. And we do offer free EV coaching. Um, so even if you have questions about e-bikes or something else that isn't just EVs, um, make sure to reach out um, to us about that too. And um, Gabriela and Julia, Norman, let me interrupt here a little bit. I, Please. I, I want to remind, ahead. I want to remind business owners that uh, haven't thought about this option of, of, you know, incentivating their employees or their, um, their themselves in, in their business to buy an electric vehicle or incentivate their, their business owner, their, sorry, their employees. In getting an electric bike, this is a great opportunity that maybe you cannot afford to give them for a down payment or for something that is big, but maybe you can tell your, your employees you'll get a, a, an extra day of vacation, you know, or something. I'm thinking about small options that can be worth it for employees. Uh, and that makes you a sustainable business. That makes you have a good impact in the community and in the environment and in the planet. So that's another good option to think about. And like Norma said, we always think, especially as Latinos, we always think like, oh, electric vehicles are not good enough for me or my business, especially those in, um, that are contractors that have big companies of construction or landscaping. Think about it, because there are trucks already that are, that are electric and that have been great for a lot of options and why not trying them out? And that's why we're having this event where we're gonna showcase this vehicles but I know that um, as business owners we might not think of an option for for us but in the long term it's gonna save you a lot of money and also you qualify for these incentives and I have a question in regards of that do you um, Gabriela or Julia know if when if as a business owner I go buy an electric vehicle are the people in the dealership aware of these incentives? Are they gonna tell me about it or do I have to bring it up um, so I can qualify? How does that work? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Some dealerships participate more heavily in the rebate and incentive process than others do. So you'll always wanna make sure you, you contact us first to figure out, you can say something as simple to us as like, I'm interested in this type of vehicle, what am I eligible for? And we can run through a list of, of what, what you're eligible for. Um, so yeah, we can help coach that process there. Some dealerships will, um, like for used, they can take the tax credit off the hood of the car price. Um, so that's, that's an option as well with certain dealerships, but you'll definitely want to make sure you go in and know what you're eligible for and what you're getting at your dealership. So that way, once you go to claim your credits or rebates later, you know exactly what you're doing. Um, and we can help you identify what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> there was also two other programs I wanted to mention as well. For folks who live in multifamily housing, so apartments, condos, all those things. Um, if you don't have charging, but you want charging, we can help coach you through that process. I work with HOAs and different um, property managers all the time to get grant funding for that. The funding is available now and it won't always be. So I'm encouraging multifamily properties to jump on it while it's available. I can help make that business case, help um, talk to property management to kind of smooth through this process. So please reach out to us if that is your case. Um, also, Colorado later this month is launching the Vehicle Exchange Program. Um, that is an income qualified program. You can get $6,000 rebate off um, for a new electric vehicle. So you have to have a 2011 or older gas or diesel vehicle that works drive it on over to a participating dealership. Um, if you're income qualified, meaning you are at or under the medium income uh, level. So if you qualify for any government programs or are enrolled in any of those um, like SNAP, TANF, 
anything like that, you are eligible immediately for this program. Um, through this program, you get $6,000 rebate for a new electric vehicle, and that is stackable with everything that else is available out there. So another really great option for folks as well that's launching this month. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then I love what you were mentioning about workplaces. That's a huge opportunity and amenity for workplaces. We are actually about to launch a workplace charging initiative specific to workplaces. So we can help. All you have to do is sign a little letter saying, I'm going to work with you to get EV charging. So you kind of commit with us to the process. You don't have to commit to installing a station. It's just like we want to formalize our relationship. What we do is we can coach you through the entire process from where's the best place to install, what do you need, um, what charger will best suit your needs, what funding is available to you, how to obtain that funding, all the way through the installation and a celebration, ribbon cutting, workshop, whatever you like to do. So if you're interested in doing that for your workplace or know or you work for a place that you would like to advocate that for, please get in touch with us or um, reach out. We'd love to connect with you and, and offer that to, to workplaces. Like you mentioned, it's a great amenity. So we love to, to talk about that and help people get charging at home and at work. I think that's ideal for everybody. That's amazing. I'm already thinking about our office here in the Longman Economic Development uh, building uh, with the Latino Chamber and all of the other business um, owners that are part of our co-working space. That would be amazing. So let's let's talk about that. And I know an hour is never going to be enough for a webinar like this with so much information and so much programs. But Norma, do you want to take us to our next question? So we, we have like 10 minutes left for our questions and then we'll go to the public's questions. Uh, okay. for the Q&A section. Sounds good. I told you, too many good stuff happening uh, to become sustainable. So and uh, I would like to, the next question for Toby, Toby Russell. So PACE launch uh, landscape program pilot in May. What is the landscaping equipment grant program about and how did you implement it? So tell us about the full program. Sure, excellent. So with all the things that we discussed around landscaping equipment before the air pollution the impact negative impact on climate change the noise the upcoming bans um, we partnered with the city of boulder to launch a pilot program to get um, commercial certified landscaping equipment in the hands of local landscapers so that they can become familiar with it um, so that they can build a relationship with um, a commercial uh, landscaping electric equipment because it has got a lot better than it used to be. The quality of equipment is amazing and there is really good equipment out there. Um, the other reason we launched the pilot program was to build relationships and trust with the landscaping companies before any regulations come into place so we've really pushed this program as a priority this year to build relationships it was um we launched started this program in january and um, designing it um and we've designed it in partnership with the latino chamber of commerce and norma who you you've been like leading a lot of this in terms of um like building up those relationships and getting the landscaping businesses to sign up for it. Um, the program itself provides 70% um, of the funding for um, commercial landscaping equipment up to $15,000, we'll cover up to $15,000. So it's a significant amount of money um, that is going towards um, equipment for commercial landscaping. We've partnered with five local retail stores, McGuckins, Mac Equipment, Longmont Outdoor Power, um, Murdox, um, and Earl Saw Shop. Um, and, and they are helping landscapers determine what is the right equipment for them. We are not the experts in landscaping equipment but we are really excited to make sure that the landscapers get expert advice to get the right equipment in their hand. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the program. We've designed it 
um, with, with smaller landscaping businesses in mind. I think all of the communications that we've had in this program have been in Spanish before English because we understand that a lot of the landscaping businesses that serve Boulder County are Hispanic. So um, it's been a really exciting program. We've had 35 businesses sign up for it and hopefully we can keep on going and grow it as the years go on um, because we really want to support the businesses that are going to be most impacted by any regulation that comes along. Yeah, and I have to add to that that the Latino Chamber of Commerce are be a valuable partnership, like you mentioned before, because we in the past event uh, we have uh, we were very successful. We have the participation of our Latino landscapers, and they have been active and uh, purchasing already electric equipment and being active and really caring about the environment um, problem. So the the sooner the better that you learn and. Also, we have another valuable partnership because like you say, we are no landscapers. So we have AXA, the um, American Green Alliance Zone that they have been instrumental to, to advise what is the type of professional equipment to, to uh, cover the workload and that a professional landscaper has daily basis. So please free, uh, Carla, if you have any questions about this because we feel like the program is, is gonna grow. Right now we are in the early stages, so learning and also applying corrections and whatever is necessary to make it really useful for our landscapers in Boulder County and hopefully uh, to support other, other to the state because at the end we are all at the same team uh, trying to make a, a better air quality. So thank you, Toby. And the last thing is how do they apply and who is eligible for this grant? Great, so um, I just put a link in the chat, but you would apply by going to the um, PACE website, the Partners for a Clean Environment website, that is pacepartners.com. Um, and there is a section there for small business equity. This is a program under that section. So um, you would go to pacepartner.com to apply for the program. This is a very simple form you fill in and then one of our amazing team will work with you all the way through the process to make sure that you have the support you need to get the equipment in your hands. Um, on that website, you'll also find other programs that we do around lighting, around HVAC, around um, reusable um, mini grants to support people um, who are moving from polystyrene because of the polystyrene ban that's coming up to reusable um, durables or, or, or takeout uh, containers. So there's lots of other incentives and programs there you can learn about too. Yeah. That's and great. That, that was, go ahead, Carla. Sorry to interrupt, Norma. I just yep. wanna, I just wanna remind uh, people that are listening and that will listen later to the recording of, of this webinar is that we, I, we know, we're conscious that we're throwing a bunch of information at you right now. We are throwing a lot of uh, resources and, and program. It's, that's why it was called Sustainability 360, because we were going to take a look at everything that is going on right now, but we know it can be a lot. If you're interested in something specifically or in multiple programs, if you were thinking about an um, electric vehicle, but you also are a landscaper and you want to access these um, resources and these programs, feel free to call the Latino Chamber. We, like Toby and Norma mentioned, we are in partnership, we are collaborating. We want to make sure that you know the resources that are out there. But yeah, it can be very overwhelming. So feel free to reach out. We'll help you if. Um, the digital world is not your thing. We are more than happy to help you submit your um, request form for the program. We are more than happy to connect you with Norma and she'll be happy to connect you with the right team member or herself. Um, she does a lot of uh, visiting, like I said before, with um, the businesses in, in the Boulder County area. So yeah, feel free to reach out to the Latina Chamber if you think that everything that you learned here is super important but you want to know more and you want to co uh, connect with the right people. Um, don't feel like you have to learn everything right now or you have to be taking notes or, or thinking about all the things that you can do. 
feel free to reach out to us. We'll give you an appointment or you can come to our office. Um, it can be over the phone. It can be virtual. It can be in person. We can go to you. Um, we want to facilitate these um, ac access to these programs as much as possible. But also we want to make sure that you, uh, the Latino community and the BIPOC community are using these programs. Mm -hmm. If the funding of these programs doesn't seem the participation of the Latino or BIPOC community, we're not going to get funds anymore. So that's exactly what we don't want to do. We need to deploy the funds so people can see um, whoever is funding either the state or federal level. Um, if they see that those funds are have been used, then they might consider to give us more funding, but we need to use these resources. Um, and that's all I wanted to add uh, before we go to the the questions, Norma. Thank you. And this is a very valuable uh, way to make community exactly to transfer valuable information to communicate that they have opportunities to access to these uh, important incentives that are allocated to our communities of color. So it's very important. So I think I'm going with the last part of this as the time is passing by very quick. So uh, for Randy. Uh, since these um, uh, policies are taking place, what options restaurants and food establishments have to replace the pollutants single use containers? And Toby, also you, uh, you can uh, come in in the conversation because we have worked some of those programs with PACE as well, because I wanna emphasize we have a lot of Latinos in the restaurant industry. So it's important to emphasize that they have this support, these resources and uh, Yes, what, once again, this is connections for you and community connecting with you directly with the Latino Chamber. We will always guide you to resources and, and these incentives opportunities. Thank you, Norma. Yes, it's very important uh, that we make these resources available to the community. So I, I had shared earlier the link to our new service alternative serviceware, sustainable serviceware guide. That's going to have a lot of resources in it. So um, that is free, so please take a look at that. Um, within that guide, I'll, I'll point to a couple of things. One is a calculator that Upstream has created for businesses to use in moving to reusables to determine what the cost savings would be. And, <clears throat> excuse me, an average savings for small businesses switching to reusables between $3,000 and $22,000 annually. So there is a cost savings that comes with uh, moving to a more sustainable reuse type system. And Toby had mentioned, um, and I put it in the link, the uh, for the city of Boulder, there is money available to assist businesses to make that transition. There are also a number of um, new entrepreneurial businesses coming online to help restaurants. So I'll mention three that I am aware of but there may be others coming soon too. And that is RCUP, Ozzy, that's O-A-Z-Z-I, and Deliver Zero. Um, and so they will actually provide reusable takeout ware, whether it's cups or, or plates, uh, containers for food and to restaurants. And then they will wash those and continue that circulation process. And so they have a whole system set up so that the, the restaurant doesn't need to wash those reusables themselves. So they provide that service and how to collect that and work with the restaurants on setting up that reusable system. So it's very exciting to see us move in that direction away from disposable single use um, waste that is, is quite a bit, uh, a considerable amount of our, our uh, problem when it comes to waste and how it impacts our climate change in, in particular. Um, I'll just finish by saying that, you know, we often think about um, energy production and transportation as two of the main sectors we focus a lot on in reducing greenhouse gases, but our consumptive emissions, so that's the emissions that come with the manufacturing, production, transportation of all of our stuff and food is quite significant. And, and it is, by reducing and reusing and looking at recycling and composting, um, we can take a big chunk out of our greenhouse gas emissions today by doing that. And so it's it's really important that we look at those strategies and, and help you know in partnership with PACE and, and municipalities and the chamber to help businesses do that and 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 um, and also see cost savings. So I'll I'll finish by that. But there's a lot of exciting things coming online now, the resources you can use.
Thank you so much. I just to close this, Pauline, you, uh, you have um, thumbs up, but also the compostable. Any comment about the changes are coming soon? Any news or should we wait until those take place? Like we know already what is happening that the um, zero waste stations, at, at least at the city of Boulder changed and there is no anymore the, the um, um, compostable station um, in the front part of the house of the restaurants, just in the kitchen because we need more uh, high quality soil, which is the, um, the main mission of um, doing composting. Any comments about it? Just to close this, it's too much, I know. So we promise this is- I'll, I'll just say really quick, it. yes, that it, it, the, the guidelines have changed already. That started this spring. Um, and so we are working with all of our business partners to, for those changes. And the main impetus, as you said, is contamination. We've just seen too much contamination in the compost stream. And that material is too valuable. You know, we want to keep it out of the landfill. So we really had to tighten up on those guidelines and keep a lot of that material um, that used to be considered compostable now out like the compostable ware. So again, if you look at that, that guide, for sustainable service where we show other alternatives other than compostables right now because they are not being accepted. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think and I think that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> that that's we it. <laughs> and, it would, and we're more than happy to host as many as we need to. But yeah, I want to go really quick with the with some of the questions from our public. And these questions came early during the webinar and I don't know if it is still here. She had a question about, are these, is this equipment, let me see, let me go back really quick. Mm. Um, okay. I'm a little lost with all the comments here. Uh, but she was, oh, is the equipment that you're offering insured and i don't know if uh, which equipment she was referring to the landscaping uh, equipment or the electric bikes i don't know i don't think it is still here anymore she's here. here oh you're here oh okay. yeah do you want to ask your question or, or give us some context in the language that you prefer well, probablemente no sé si hablaron del equipo de restaurantes. I don't know you spoke about restaurant equipment, but I really want to know if the restaurant equipment that's offered through the county programs, are they insured in case they break down? That's my question. I don't know that applies to, to the, you know, the landscaping equipment as well. Yeah, so for restaurants, I don't know if uh, Toby can Toby, address that. Toby can, yeah. Um, so in addition to the landscape uh, equipment program, Partners for Clean Environment has a another program that offers refrigeration, dishwashers, ice machine um, replacements um, for equipment that's older than 2009. So we pay for 70% off the uh, new equipment. Uh, we've partnered with a, a supplier who comes and delivers and installs the new equipment and removes the old inefficient equipment. Um, all the equipment that comes from our programs belongs to the participants. So once uh, the business gets the landscaping equipment, or in this case, the restaurant gets kitchen equipment, that equipment is theirs 100%. And, and we are no longer going to, we're, we're not going to be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of, of said equipment. Um, but most all the equipment is brand new. It comes with a two or three year warranty um, so that um, the, our partners who are supplying it will come out and fix it if there are any issues. Um, new equipment does not break down like the equipment we're replacing. We're replacing equipment that's older than 2009 and does break down a lot and does cause issues with food temperatures and such like. So hopefully with brand new Energy Star equipment, there's less need to have it maintained, but it does come with warranties because it is brand new, but the county isn't, it doesn't, it doesn't ensure or like have responsibility for the equipment after it's been installed. But we do 
maintain relationships with the businesses and do everything we can to support any issues that arise because we want to make sure that everyone gets exactly what they need. So right. one Tell extra advice you. about yeah. it um, for EDCs like you know, and restaurants and uh, electric um, blanket equipment is just when you get one of those brand new Energy Star certified equipment, register the, the companies that like through like different brands, they have the, the maintenance that doesn't cost nothing to you because I are under warranty. But if you don't register your equipment, probably you will have problems. So for me, you receive your new equipment, do the right thing. And also with the landscaping equipment, don't ever, if it's under warranty, brand new equipment, don't, don't touch it. If it's something to repair, go to your dealer Autorize that they will know what to do better. That way you keep your warranty the best as you can. So yeah, and another another piece of advice here is, is that if you're past your two or three year warranty, make sure you have a, 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 a the right coverage with your insurance. Because it, your for your business, it can cover your equipment. For restaurants um, specifically that we are talking about in the food industry. Make sure your restaurant, your food truck, your any business that you have has the right coverage. Make sure that your policy covers your equipment in case it breaks after your warrant, your manufacturer warranty is done. So that's you know the first one. Register your equipment as soon as it comes, so you can ask for for maintenance. But also once that warranty is not covering your equipment anymore, make sure that you have the right coverage on your insurance because. Yeah, it's it's important that that, and I know we are out of time. I just want to make sure we're asking the last couple of questions. Um, is there anything happening? And this question is for uh, Gabriela and Julia. Um, is there anything happening um, to extend the duration of the batteries for the electric vehicles uh, for long trips? Do you know anything about that? And I know we know you're not the dealer or the manufacturer, but is there anything that you know about these? Yeah, yeah. So there is um, the range is getting extended on these EVs with every model release. So I think we're seeing cars that have upwards of 400 miles in range now, which is about the same as a gas car these days. So the mileage is pretty close to the same. On top of that, we see more and more um, installations of public charging stations, both level two and level three. Um, some level three charging stations can charge an EV in like 20 to 30 minutes at 80%, depending on what model you have. So I think um, there's more being done on both the vehicle technology side and the charging support and infrastructure side that's making that less and less of a concern for folks as time's passing. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela, for that. And then the last question is, does that same thing happened with the landscaping tools. And I don't know if, if Toby or, or Norman want to elaborate a little bit more on these, but this is why we've been partnering with PACE to have these um, trainings for the landscapers on how to use the electric equipment and then how to replace their batteries and recharging and all of that. But I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that, Toby. I will unmute myself and elaborate a little bit. Um, so when we are looking at the equipment, as Norma said, we've partnered with AGSA, who are specialists in commercial uh, landscaping equipment. And the equipment that is offered under the grant is equipment that has been tested. Um, and every piece of equipment is recommended to come with the right amount of batteries for a full day's work um, out in the field. So we are making sure that we are right sizing the battery capacity with the commercial loads that a business will be having. Um, so we are really trying to make sure that um, it is going to be a replacement that works for the business um, rather than them go, uh, a business going and getting a piece of equipment that's meant for residential, that doesn't have the battery capacity, that doesn't have the durability and can't last as long. So um, we're really trying very hard to make sure that we are providing the charging infrastructure along with the correct amount of batteries to serve um, the businesses. That sounds great. Thank you so much. And um, on my end, I just want to thank our panelists and our attendees for being here. Our panelists are 
great resources for our community and they have great programs going on. So feel free to reach out to them. We're gonna send a follow-up email and then feel free to reach out to the Latina Chamber and we can guide you on the right direction. Um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Norma, I don't know if you wanna add any last thoughts. Just my big appreciation for being so interested in our community, our Latino community, and there are many opportunities and the doors are open for you to keep extending these opportunities. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Gracias.